one who discovers anything does have or can have an idea how it will be used. All the scientist can do is to go forward, to understand, to apply, and to explain. Edward Teller said that he didn't like being called the father of the hydrogen bomb. But as a Jewish emigre from fascist Hungary in the 1930s, the particle physicist was convinced that to save the world from tyranny, you needed the most powerful weapon known to man. The nuclear physicist Ralph Moyer studied under Edward Teller. The controversy over the development of the hydrogen bomb that split the scientific community between those who supported Teller and those who supported Oppenheimer. In many ways, Robert Oppenheimer was the opposite of Teller. An accomplished scientist who became the head of the Manhattan Project, he was known as the father of the atomic bomb. But having opened the Pandora's box of nuclear weaponry, Oppenheimer questioned the need to build the much more powerful hydrogen bomb. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. This bomb relied not only on fission, the splitting of atoms in a chain reaction, but on the fusion of atoms the kind of incredible reaction that powers the sun. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Oppenheimer said, don't develop the hydrogen bomb, or if you do, go very slowly. And Edward Teller was kind of a warrior against tyranny, you know, Nazis and then the Soviet. And, and he said, if, if it can be done, it will be done by the Soviets. We should, America should have it, and have it better and sooner and bigger. Having escaped from Hitler, I think I had a good idea, or rather a horrible idea, what was at stake. And I was among those who were exceedingly eager to do whatever was possible to stop this horror. And uh, he won. Many in the scientific community nevertheless sided with Oppenheimer and, and um, he became persona non grata among uh, many of the scientific community. In the thick of Cold War paranoia, Teller questioned the integrity of his former colleague and now his adversary. The scientific community considered it a betrayal. Teller became an outcast. He, he wanted to make a contribution to mankind, but, but he's also very interested in science and anything new. It, that intrigued him. He was kind of like a, tech, a techie or a geeky kind of a guy. You know, and, and why did he do the bomb? Yeah, it was patriotic to have a strong defense, but also it was fascinating science. I don't think he did things to 
counteracted as a legacy. It, um, it bothered him that old friends had turned away. Mr. President, the technology required is easily within the means of even the smallest nuclear power. Teller's impassioned support of nuclear research and his volatile personality made him an inspiration to Stanley Kubrick for the character of Dr. Strangelove. Despite all the controversy, Teller never met a bomb he didn't like. Apart from building thermonuclear weapons designed to kill thousands, Teller urged more peaceful uses of these devices, like rocketing a bomb into the moon for science, or using them to build a second Panama Canal. Well, by 1958, I was a student in Berkeley, and in 1961, I heard that he was giving a course in engineering with nuclear explosives. Man is exploring a source of enormous, potentially useful energy, the nuclear explosion. So the bomb came along and the ho horribleness of the bomb, and then these people said, in what was called plowshare, you can put a bomb underground and blow a hole. You can put a, a series of bombs and you can blow a ditch. And so there's these studies, and, and you know, they're outlandish studies. They said, we could have a series and we touch these off at once and we could make a sea level canal all the way from the Pacific to the Atlantic. This is the day of reality that Plowshare is working to fulfill, when it can deliver to mankind a proven tool and a proven technology. Well, that was intriguing. And you want a harbor someplace? We'll make a harbor where there was, you know, a harbor that has room for ships to turn around and so on. We could do that. The Soviets did some in northern Siberia. And it, anyway, that was the context of this class in 1961 that uh, he offered. Uh, he would come into the class in the morning and he was, ah, I gotta tell you the latest. And, and he would tell him, oh, somebody just yesterday had just bored a hole into it and went inside one of these cavities where recently they'd shot off an explosive. And then he would tell us about the results in class. You know, and as a young student, my eyes would get about that big. And it was just an interesting, again, feeding off the geekiness of it. You know, you could do something outlandish with nuclear explosives that you couldn't otherwise do. That was 1961, and that began a um, more than 40-year relationship with Edward Teller. And, uh, over the years, I would be summoned to his office. Uh, in about uh, uh, 2003, he summoned me the last time. And he asked if I could, uh, could we meet three times a week for the next 12 weeks? I want to do something on vision. At the age of 94, Lonely, blind, and largely disliked, Teller began work on a final project, a paper about a safer kind of nuclear reactor, powered not by conventional uranium, but by the element thorium. It's estimated that thorium is three times more abundant than uranium, the element currently used in nuclear plants. And scientists say there's so much of it that it can produce more energy than all the world's oil, coal, and uranium combined. Many believe thorium also fell out of the spotlight because making a bomb out of it is thought to be almost impossible. He was worried that you know, the world badly needs energy it need, and we need to be non-carbon, it doesn't need nuclear, and it's not getting enough of it. Uh, we would talk about all fissure reactors, all possible ones, and always coming around to thorium. He liked thorium. When he knew I was involved in thorium and molten salt reactors, he said, okay, 
I've heard enough. I like the molten salt reactor. You've convinced me. Let's write a paper. And, you know, with his medical condition, being blind, he could walk barely. The, the way it would work was I would write a draft, and then I would read it to him. Because by this time, he was completely blind. He would say, that last paragraph you read, second sentence, start there. And he would dictate. And then he'd say, no, back up that one and change this word. He, he could see in his mind words, punctuations, and, and I would be furiously writing. The paper was rejected by the prestigious journal Science and Nature, and finally published in 2005 in the journal Nuclear Technology. But the father of the H-bomb wouldn't live to see this final peaceful contribution to nuclear science. He died in 2003 at the age of 95, insisting to the very end that scientists don't bear the slightest social responsibility for the uses of their inventions. Do you think he was anxious about his legacy? No. In the context of no. nuclear science? No, I mean, he had a solid ego. He did not have to worry about his own ego. I believe that a scientist has an extremely important job. And that is to make science. Nobody else can do it. It's a wonderful business. It is, in a way, what drives humanity forward. It is what unites humanity in the end, for better or for worse. And it is the scientist who alone can do that.